All right, so um, again, this is kind of our first in our little mini series of, you know, what do you do when you get one of these things and you go, oh my gosh, it's got a manual this big and half of it's in Chinese and you can't figure out what to do. So we, we thought about this, you know, every November, December, we always do a presentation about <coughs> telescopes, people who are thinking about buying a telescope for Christmas, right? And I haven't been around that long, but probably the last four or five years. I don't remember ever hearing anybody in that presentation saying, go out and buy a go-to scope. We never say that. But come January, February, there's a lot of people that come in and say, hey, I brought this great, great new scope and look at it. And it's got all these bells and whistles and gadgets and I have no idea how to make it work. Well, you know, it's really all about marketing. These manufacturers of telescopes have great marketing programs. And you see stuff like this and you look at this and go, wow, you mean if I bought that, I can set it up in my backyard and I can automatically look at that. Yes, that's what I want. Got news for you. That doesn't happen. <laughs> you don't see that. But they continue. Now, hey, here's one. Now I can discover space for myself. Now, there's an introvert, right? I don't need any of you people. I can do it myself. Then, I love this one. And actually, I have not seen this, but I'm dying to. It is the new StarSense Explorer. You actually take your phone and somehow marry it to your telescope and it shows you exactly what you want to do. Very similar to what Rick kind of showed us with the, the widgets and gadgets last year and by last, uh, last month. And by the way, I looked that up and I may get one for my scope. They don't make one, but I've been talking to them and we may be able to adapt it. And then how dare them? They go so far as to use uh, our heroes our people of all, and they take our guy and they prostitute him and say, look, he's been out exploring planets and universes, but when he comes home, he buys a Celestron. That's the right way. But you know, it's just, ah, we can't do that. How do we go about this? So what I want to do tonight is again, show you um, exactly what we're going to do and tonight's session is going to be how do you set up a German equatorial mount. Now I have practiced this presentation a number of times and I guarantee you sometime during this presentation I'm going to call this a Germantown equatorial mount because I've done it. So if you hear it well I'm sorry we'll have to cut the, the film a little bit. So what's the big deal about this? Why is it so popular? Why do you hear people talking about it? And when did it come from? Interestingly enough, there was a gentleman by the name of Joseph von Fraunhofer back in 1824. He was a physicist, but he was also into glass. So he was making, obviously, telescopes. Now, remember I earlier talked about this is shameless plug anytime I talked about you guys and anybody wants to do a presentation that would be a good one okay that guy really when I looked up some of his background he had an interesting life anyway he has been commissioned to build this telescope and he's building it for this observatory in Estonia he's German um, and he's building this thing, and the telescope at the time was going to be called the Great Dorpet Observatory Refractor. It was nine and a half inches by 14 feet long. Okay, now that was it. I mean, that was the cat's meow at that time. 1824, nobody had that. So he built this this telescope and then he kind of tried to figure out well what am I going to put it on and I got to figure out how this thing works so he actually came up with this mount that 
really later became called the German Equatorial Mount. Now, you don't hear about him as being the guy who invented the nine and a half inch, 14 foot refractor. But you hear about this particular mount everywhere. Now, here's the kind of process of it. And think about this. Um, you want to find something somewhere, all right? And you're in two-dimensional universe. You got up, down, left, right. Now, I'm looking at the faces here. You might not know it, but you, you might. Um, you guys remember Etch-a-Sketch? You remember how, you know, you, mom got it and you shook it up and you went, and you went up and then you went over. And then you went down and, it, and if you were really good, you could work both of those knobs at the same time and you could get a diagonal. Okay? Well, guess what? That's the way scopes at the time worked. You could go up, down, and you could go back and forth, left and right. So when you're thinking about, okay, I want to track something in the sky. All right, what does it do? It starts in the east and it goes to the west. And if you're looking toward the north, it does this big circle. Well, that's not a square wave, okay? So how do you do that? Well, here's what he figured out. He figured out that if I could take of those two axes and I could eliminate one of them, what would happen? Well, Let's say this is my Earth, right? Okay, and there's my axis. And we all know that the central point is the north central point, which is very near Polaris, right? All right, so Earth is kind of like this. Now, if you put your telescope, well, I guess we're about right here, all right? And the old way the telescope did, you tried to move, you know, up, over, up, over, up, over, up, up, all night long. These guys are sitting, well, what if you eliminated that one axis by making one of the axes of the, or axes, of the telescope parallel. Well, if you did that, then you eliminate a problem because now all you have to do is have one axis tracking all night long. You don't have to worry about two of them. So remember, the old telescopes, when they got these things, these guys had hand knobs. And they were twisting one hand knob this way, one hand knob this, kind of like an excess sketch. They were trying to go that way. Now, all of a sudden, all they have to do is twist one knob. Why? Because the other knob, when it's, it, it's direct line access, they simply put a clock drive on it and make it turn the same amount of time, 23 hours and 57, six, seven, six, seven minutes, okay, and make it clock that. So it's twisting the same way the whole time. So that was what made it incredibly interesting and really precise. It is still to this day, and again, 1824 to this day, it's a really popular mount. Now, because of computerization and uh, really good manufacturing these days, they can really, really fine-tune mounts and a lot of the larger observatories, because the way this mount is designed, imagine that you would put a, a gigantic scope on this that weighed a couple of hundred pounds. Well, it's going to beat the heck out of it, and it's certainly not going to be portable. So with new technology, the new scopes, whether or not it be the single arm or the dual arm, have gotten really good, especially for the big arrays and the big observatories. So now they're using those. But the German, German equatorial mount, almost said it, um, is still incredibly popular. In fact, I look today, some of the big, um, rather expensive models that you can get so astrophysics is a big one, and they build great ones. Software BIS builds them, 10 Micron builds them. In fact, I was looking at the astrophysics, and just for the heck of it, um, they are now selling, astrophysics is selling a 360 Mach, and it has a walking out of the door price of $26,000. Now, with that, you don't even get the tripod or the pier. 
<laughs> you just get the amount and forget about the weights. Those are $300 a piece. I'm just making that up. So somebody from astrophysics will probably call me and scream at me. But it's, I mean, it's a beautiful mount. And trust me, I'd love to have one. Uh, the only thing is I kind of sort of can't justify the mount in my car is worth a lot more than the car. So I'm, I'm going to stick with the other ones. But that's the whole thing. So that is basically why they're so popular. And I'm going to start with the putting everything together and show you what I actually do. Now, just like anything, I'm kind of, um, yeah, my wife calls me names, but I'm going to say I'm just anal. I'm a list guy. Okay, so we get ready to go on vacation. I'm writing a list. What do I need to pack? Where do I, you know, where do I do this? I always have an observing checklist or a, you know, some kind of a checklist so I can make sure I know exactly what I'm bringing. Now, some of the new folks in the room say, gee, that's really, you know, when you get older. Let me ask the older guys here, okay? How many times have you packed your car, driven an hour to Burton's, unloaded everything, and went, damn, I forgot blank. How many of you have done it? Yeah, okay. All right, we all do it. Write the list, all right? It helps out quite a bit. So um, here's the setup. The first thing I do is I take the tripod and I'm going to align it north. You remember that axis that we want parallel? Well, it's got to be pointing toward the north central point, so which is near Polaris. So it's got to be pointing that way. This little abutment here is, is positioned right there. So, uh, and I like to put one leg out there. You could actually put any of the other ones up. I like one out like that, so I've got the tripod that way. And I use a trusty compass because I always like to get there early during the daytime and you can't see Polaris or uh, the Big Dipper or anything else. So I pull out my compass and I say, okay. And I, I always look at compass because I line it up like this and try to figure out if I can get another point there and figure it out. So um, keep in mind, compasses, metal tripods, don't always go together. You put one near it, it's gonna throw things off. Also, be careful of Burton's because there are high power wires that you might stand underneath and you're looking at that, tri that compass and it's going like this. So be careful, get away from it, point it. You're pretty rough is, is okay. The other thing I'm a little anal with is I always like to eliminate any problems. So I just have a, a simple carpenter's level and I want to level this thing, make sure my mount is good this way, good this way, all right? I also want to check the, 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 the ground that I'm on. It would be terrible if you set this thing up and sometime during the night in the soft dirt, it starts to lean over and everything goes to heck. So I either bring wooden blocks or stepping stones or something, throw them down, put the scope on top of it, and I'm good to go. So I've got it leveled. I've got it pointed north. I'm all fine. The next thing I do is um, I am going to grab my mount and I'm going to take my mount and put it on. Now, this is the heaviest thing. So it fits right in the slots. If I can get it right. Now, the one thing you're going to see me doing, and please do this as a habit, don't take your hand off of anything until you're 100% sure it's bolted down and tightened. Because you'll put it on or do something, turn around and you hear a crash. And it's like, oh no, it fell. So I always try at best to try to keep one hand on it at all times. So um, I've got this threaded, it's starting to tighten, so I know I'm pretty good with that. And I'll crank it up a little bit more. So I'll bolt it all in, make sure it's snug. There, snug here. All right, good. Next step, we're all good, good to go. All right, so. The next step on this particular one is to, you can actually do a rough polar alignment. So remember, this is that axis, right? 
This is the one we want parallel with the Earth axis. The cool thing about this thing, it's got an extra scope that goes through the middle of it. Okay, it's right there. So it's a direct line through here and you can actually look forward and see where Polaris is. Now, you have to turn the saddle 90 degrees to be able to do it. But it's a complete open shot so you can look through. Now, with that particular scope, let me show you what it does. If you look through this, you're going to see this pattern. Okay, cool. It's not to, not to scale, but huh, what do you do with that? Well, here's what you do with it. Because of where things are during the night and that particular day, you can match that pattern, okay, and rotate the scope to match that pattern with exactly what you're seeing. And there's a absolutely wonderful little app called Polar Scope Align Pro, which cost a whopping $3.99 that'll tell you at this particular time that's up there, at that longitude, this is what you're supposed to be seeing through that scope. Okay, so if you're not seeing that, all you have to do is rotate this one way or the other until it matches up. So I'm looking through this and I'm matching it up and as soon as I see that particular pattern or this particular pattern like this, so the Big Dipper is going to be down here and Cassiopeia is going to be up here. If it's in that range, I know, okay, that's great. I'm there. The next step is to adjust the azimuth and the, and the alt altimeter, the altitude and the azimuth, so that you line up Polaris. When you're looking through this, you can actually see Polaris and you'll line up Polaris into that little circle. And as soon as I do that, Bingo, I know I've got a rough polar alignment and I'm good to go to the next step. So what I'll do then is I'll simply move everything back to its normal position and there are little index lines all over the place. So I put those back, put caps back on, I make sure I don't let anything go until I know it's nice and secure, get all my caps done and I'm ready for the next phase. So, now I'm going to install the counterweights. So, here is the important thing about counterweights. Um, after you put this together, I, I would say put your scope together in the daytime so you kind of get a feel for where things are. And I kind of cheat a little bit. You can probably see little marks everywhere. If I know what my scope is going to weigh, in other words, the scope, the eyepiece, and things like that, and I put it on and I get it all balanced, what I'll do is I'll put a little piece of tape, and I'll put a little piece of tape on this piece, a little tape, piece of tape on the other piece, and I'll put them together and match them up so that I don't have to struggle every time. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to install the counterweights. Now, for this particular one, I know that I have to have two counterweights on it, so I'm going to have to have a large counterweight, and I know, because I've got a little bit of a mark here, that first counterweight goes right there. Again, tighten everything down. The second counterweight is about half that weight, and it goes just behind it, about right there, and I'm going to probably move these out a little bit. Now, really important thing here. This little thing is called a tow boat. And it's really important because if you don't put this on, sometime in the night, maybe the dew gets to this bolt and it loosens up or something, and you're standing right there and you got about a 10 pound weight falling right on your toe. So put the tow boat on so it doesn't fall off. So get that on. I know I'm good and safe. I'm happy with everything at this point in time. And next step is going to be install the telescope tube, the accessories and everything else. Now I've took, taken the liberty of going ahead and putting everything together how I know it's going to fit. Now remember I just mentioned I had my little mark. That's not in. Let's see. 
So there's my little mark. I know I'm right up to that. Again, don't let anything go until you know it's good and tight. So I've got it. Everything's snug. I'm happy with it. Now what I want to do is balance this. Now what, what's the big deal about balancing? What are you talking about balancing? Well, remember, I've got a big telescope here and I've got a counterweight here. Okay? And there's also weight this way. So there's two motor drives in here. There's one that drives this gear that would go this way, and there's one that drives this one that would make this twist. If you balance these, it's going to take a lot of pressure off that motor. If they're unbalanced, that motor, when it goes to turn, is going to strain. And it's probably not going to work as efficient as it should. So what you want to do is balance it as much as possible. So what I do is I say, okay, let's see if I can balance. And you can see right now we're heavy, right? So what do I do? I take my weights and I move them in. Now, there is, uh, and if we have a physician, physics major in the audience, they can probably explain things. It's much better to have your weight toward the middle of your axis as opposed to if I just wanted the big weight, I could put it way, that, way out here. It's much better to have your weight towards the middle. So um, I get it. There's my balance. I'm happy with that, right? Now I want to balance this one to make sure this one's okay. The first thing I do is I usually balance it here to see I'm a little top heavy this way or, or back heavy towards the eyepiece. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move that a little forward. And all I do is loosen the saddle a little higher than I normally have it. Loosen the saddle and give it a balance. Now I'm a little heavy the other way. So it's just going to take a little bit move it back that should be pretty good there we go so now my scope is balanced right haven't taken my hands off of it I'm gonna go back touch all the little knobs all the little things that I know and so we're balanced both in deck and RA and so I'm happy right now I'm ready to go to the next step so I always go back and set this on the index marks and if you get a chance to look at them I usually come back and I take automotive paint, touch up paint with the little paintbrush and I find where my index mark is and I just put a mark on it. Now, um, the, the funny thing was I did the tape routine with my other scope and I thought it was being really cool because it's red. So I got red tape and I put the red tape on it and then at night I went, where's the, where's the mark? Where's the mark? And it wasn't until I put a white light on it and figured out I was looking through a red light and like you can't see red. So I said, okay, dummy, you got to put white tape on it. All right. So I've got my clutches both engaged. They're both locked. And you can see it's not going to move. Next thing I need to do is go ahead, hook up my power, and I'll also hook up my hand paddle. I, I like to, as much as possible, if you've got wires hanging off, get them kind of buttoned down somewhere. And I, I really like the way the scope has this extra hole. That's not why it's for, but I put it right there so I can kind of make sure everything's locked down really good. Um, I will use uh, Velcro to kind of hold other wires down. So because this is going to move, you don't want to catch a wire on something. All right, next thing is the hand controller. And it just simply plugs in right there. Now we go for power. All right, I'm in good shape. On goes the power. All right, now let me show you what's going to happen once we do this. The hand paddle, as you can probably see, I hope you can see, looks orange. Okay, well, it's, it's, it's turned on, right? And it's going to start asking me things. And what I want to do right now is I want to follow the instructions that are on the hand paddle. This is what the hand paddle looks like. So it, it's going to, there's only one time that it's going to ask you your location. And if you don't ever change locations in the general vicinity, it won't pop up with this. It'll simply pop up with the other things. So 
the hand paddle instructions on the scope setup say the first thing, okay, you want to do it, it says, okay, make sure your scope has the index marks aligned. That's the index mark here and the index mark here. I know they are because I put them there. All right. Then it's going to say, all right, what's the time of day? And right now we are at what? Give me a close one. 58. Okay. And I'm going to enter that. It's going to ask me AM or PM. That's my next one. We are PM. And then daylight savings time. Well, Steve, where are we? Tonight? Tomorrow? We're okay, right? Yeah. All right. We're still in daylight savings time, according to Steve. And then the date today, and I've got that. And once it does that, this is what I'm seeing on this, the chart on this little thing. Okay? Now, once we got all that in, it's going to ask me, all right, great. You're terrific. You've got everything entered in. Now let's do an alignment. This particular scope is going to ask for, at minimum, a two-star line. I usually explain that. It's like a reverse GPS. It wants to know where it is. And the only way it can know where it is, if it points to a particular star and you line it up. Now, shameless plug for the awards program. How do you know what star you're pointing on if you don't know what the star is? So, you know, sign up for the awards program so you can track it. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, yep, I want to do an alignment, and it's going to ask me for a couple of stars. I'm going to try to make this so it um, doesn't make me crawl to the ground to look through the scope. And it won't. All right, so let's, uh, let's go. I'm going to go to Navi, okay? So what it's going to do, it's going to slew where it thinks that star is, okay? I've got two finder scopes on here. The first finder scope is here. It's got a diagonal. It's a 90-degree diagonal. That's, it came with the scope. It's okay. It's cool. I don't use it that much. I really like the Telerad. If you were here for Rick's presentation, I think he showed the Telerad. It's got three concentric circles. And as you look through, you can look through and see those three circles. Now, the great thing about Telerad is I can look through and I've got one eye open and the other eye looking through and seeing that so I can easily kind of line it up. So I'm looking through and I'm going to adjust the scope just a little bit to where it lines exactly up. And, okay, yep, I'm happy with that. And then it says, okay, great. You've got it lined up in the finder scope. Now line it up in the eyepiece. So now I'm going to get really fine adjustment. So I'll look in my eyepiece and I'll move these buttons to, till I get the store exactly in the middle of the eyepiece. Now, if I push these buttons right now, you're probably not going to notice the scope move because it's such a fine, fine movement because I'm, I'm moving an arc second, maybe. So I would touch the scope a couple of times, the movement a couple of times, get it done, and hit the align button, and it says, great, your next star is Capella. All right, I think that's a pretty good one. Now, obviously, I would take the cap off, right? <laughs> Just want you guys to know. So it's going to move to where Capella is. I'm going to say, OK. Once it gets there, I'm going to let it settle down. Because what it does is it tries to get rid of a little bit of a backlash. So it'll overshoot the star and then kind of come back to it. It's settled down. I'm going to look through my eyepiece. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Let me move a little bit. OK, I like that. Yep. And then let's see through the eyepiece. Yep, it looks good there. I hit the align button and it says, hey, you want to kind of add a couple of extra stars to make the alignment even better? Well, sure, okay, let's add one. Um, it's given me a couple of options. It says, hey, you want to put in Regulus? Okay, sounds good to me. Again, remember, you got to know where the stars are because it may point to something and it's in the wrong part of the sky. And again, 
The big kicker is if it points to Pollock and Castor, or say points to Pollock, and it's actually on Castor, you could be off. So you got to know which is which and how to do it. All right, it's done the same routine. I would, as soon as it stops, I would go back again through the finer scope, do a little adjustment, say, yep, that's it. Then I would go to the eyepiece, do whatever adjustments I need, and say it's aligned, and it is thinking right now and saying, hey, yeah, we're happy with everything. Would you like a couple of more stars to calibrate? And I'm going to say, nah, I'm cool. Let's go with that. And all of a sudden, I get CGM ready. It's ready to go. All I do at this point in time is I have some options. I can look at uh, solar system, stars, deep sky. Let's see what deep sky does. And if I hit the deep sky, I can say, give me a named object. Hey, there's Andromeda. Let's do that. And all I do is hit the button, and it's going to slew to where Andromeda is. And as soon as it settles down, all I have to do is look at the eyepiece, and we're good to go. So. That's basically it. When I get to that point, I'm a happy camper and everything's cool. So, uh, another couple of quick bonuses here. Let's say, um, first bonus, focus. That killed me when I first started because I would look through this thing and I would touch it and it would vibrate a little bit and then I'd move it again and I'd touch it and it was just, ah. Oh. And then if I had a, a camera on it, I'd take a picture and it was fuzzy and it's like, oh my gosh, I can't do it. How do I fix that? There is an interesting thing called a Batonoff mask and this is what it looks like, okay? And when you take this mask, and you put it on the front like that. What it does, you focus it on a star, by the way, on a bright star. What it does, it gives you a picture of the star with these diffraction spikes. Now, not all three of them. It's just going to give you one. Let's take a look at this one, okay? If it gave you this one, it's out of focus. Why is it out of focus? Well, look right there. You see these angles? They're not the same. So all I would do is adjust my focus until I got those angles the same. See, here's the other one. They're not the same. This is the one that I really want. So I would kind of work my fine focus until I got it looking exactly like that. You want to come up to the front and see it? You can't see it? <laughs> Can you see the difference? How many fingers? <laughs> so that's what I'd see um, when I'd come up with something like that, and, and I really like it. Um, then the other thing is, don't forget, take the thing off, because if not, every star is going to look like that. The last bonus I will kind of show you, and I really like this over time, was um, I got a observing bench, okay? which is just a little portable stool. And the great thing is, now I'd never have my, my scope up this high. This is just way too high. It's usually about a foot or so lower than this. But the great thing is, you're gonna be out there sitting all night. Well, why not sit on a bench? Okay, I got a bench here, and then you can easily adjust this to get up a little bit higher. Or, if you want to, adjust it all the way down. So that when that eyepiece comes down to here, I'm not breaking my back trying to do this number all night long to look through it. So I, I love these. In fact, um, Steve knows how to make them. So, you know, you want the plans? There it is. <laughs> I'll have to bring that one. Out. Yes, yes, that, that could be a presentation. Yep, and that's it. Any questions? I either did a good job or put you guys to sleep. I don't know. There's, yes. There's an etch -a sketch too. I just saw it on the other internet, and it has a third degree of. Yes. <laughs> I'm yeah. I'm 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 old. Thing. I'm old. We only had the two way. You only had the two knobs. <laughs> yes.
Either way. You set everything up, aligned it, got it going great. You say go to Andromeda and it slews over to Andromeda and you look in there and there's absolutely nothing there. Yes. <laughs> Do you have to start back over? Um, if, if that were in fact the case, there's a couple of things I would look for first. Number one, I would look to make sure my location is right. And I'd also look to sh make sure my, my time is right my date is right, and daylight savings, and go through those things. I, in fact, so not this particular scope, but my other scope is really, really precise, mm -hmm. and it knows the difference between my house in Carrierville and Burton's. And if I don't reset it, it's off every time. And it's like, you're kidding. Why is that? That, 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 that makes that much difference. It made that much wow. bigger difference, that big a difference. Wow. Yeah, and I just couldn't get it. For some reason, I couldn't get it to go, and then I finally, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, I didn't reset it to that, the right, you know, latitude, longitude. That may be one thing to look at. It could be a couple other things. Now, again, um, I bought this scope, and I had it for two years, three years, and it started to drag a little bit. And so I actually bought a kit and took it apart and rebuilt it and polished everything. That did wonders. I mean, it, you, if you look at it, you know, when it swings, it, it swings like that. Before that, it, 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 and it got caught every time. Yes? Um, I have an 8SC, um, so it's a little bit different. But it gives me about five different uh, alignment modes, auto two star, one star. Yep. So yeah. the two, which, which one do you recommend, uh, the two star alignment? You, you know, it depends on how precise you want to get. Um, if, I'm, if, if I'm just observing, I'm good with three stars. If, if when I do it, they're looking like they're spot on, you know, if, if, if I did like three and they were all like right there, I'd say, hey, that's pretty cool. Um, again, my other scope, um, I, it, it's calibration run. It will do, like they suggest, do 150 to 200 different spots. And it'll slew, take a picture, go somewhere else, and it'll do it 200 times. Uh, this one only has the option for like five to six. But if, if you're hitting it dead on, you're good. Now, it also may be, again, I only did a rough polar alignment. There is a another method that you can do a more accurate polar alignment to get really dead on. And so that, that works as well. The other thing that if you notice this one has an extra dovetail bar, um, I can put a guide scope on it and connect it through the mount here so that I, the guide scope will have a separate camera. And once you get to a spot in the sky, it, that camera will take a picture of the star and it'll move the mount little tiny movements throughout the night so it keeps the, the it keeps it focused right on the stars. Any other questions? Yes. According to the time, if you are wrong on, on the daylight side time, yes. it will give you 15 degrees error. 15 degrees off for, for, for that, that one hour change, yeah. And 15 degrees in this, you're way over here, so you're way off. The other thing I, w I would also mention is when you do this initial, um, get a, a, a high magnet, uh, you know, a, a eyepiece that's pretty big that you get a wide, wide field of view as much as you can. So you could narrow it in and, and get it real precise. What eyepiece? Uh, this one's 35. You find low power, medium power, what is better for... Uh, the low power that is cool to define low power yeah well yeah i mean is a low power best when you're getting it set up or is a yes. medium power better low i i like low because i can low. see more sky i mean, like you low. use like more low. than one i mean you start with your your low then you move to high. then you can move higher yeah yeah, yeah. If, if you're getting if you're getting them dead on every time then yeah you could move to a 22 i have a 22 and a 17 and you could get a little tighter yeah. with that you don't find that there's more error when you're trying to center a star in a low power eyepiece versus a medium. It's training. You gotta train your eye you train to your center eye. of the eyepiece. Okay. Yes, sir. Way in the back. Um, how much do you pay for it? <laughs> that's, you didn't hear that question. That's, that's, that's <laughs> confidential because we're taping it, and my my wife might listen to the tape. <laughs> I'll tell you later. <laughs> Yes. If you're going to be 
doing photography, yes, you balance it. Some people you say you you, boink, you you balance um, east heavy, okay, or wherever. So depending upon where you're going to be shooting, you you kind of balance east heavy um, because remember that that drive okay is always going to go from east west right so if you balance it you've always got it kind of cocked if you if it's balanced the other way the the when the gears do it it might do something like that so if you balance it like east heavy it's always if as a telescope goes it's always going to be pushing on those mesh gears and i i guess better analogy is like this all right so if, if you balanced it, it's good like that, right? If it's balanced the other way, it, it, the gears are going to be doing this as it tries to turn. So always east heavy will pull it, pull it down. Yep. And it's just a little bit, it's not much. Yeah, yeah, not much at all. Yeah. Um, as far as the, uh, the finder scope and, and the alignment with the with your main scope, mm -hmm. your telerad, I mean, um, do you always leave it attached or do you, do you take it off and then you have to do your No, I take it off and if, if during the day when I'm setting up, sometimes I'll like, if it's, if it's daytime, I'll find the top of a tree real far and I'll look through it and I'll look through here and I'll, I'll, I'll line them both up so that I know. It may be that they've, they've moved a little bit. The great thing about Telerad is you can adjust them really easy. And so, yeah, I'll look at a tree or a building or something real far away and make sure that they line up real good. Or I may do that on the first star I get to. Yep. Yes? If you don't have a scope that runs through the axis, points toward yes. the north celestial pole, uh, or if you've got a fork mount and you're going to you know, put your telescope onto a tripod with, with like a wedge. Yes. One thing, and I didn't invent this, but uh, I, I read it somewhere, and I'll, I'll give the guy credit if I can remember his name, but what you can do, if you've got a planetarium software app in your phone, mm -hmm. you can put your phone on the, on the wedge or at the, at, at the where the scope would exit on that and line it up with a south celestial pole. Okay, because if you're pointing oh, yeah. the south celestial pole, you're going the other way. And the north celestial pole is right up there, right opposite, and then you line it up that way. And okay, that eliminates the compass part. Right. Where you got the, where you got the compass too close to all <coughs> of the iron in your mouth and the, and the things swinging yeah. around, or you got an electric field or something. Yeah, yeah, that is a great idea. Um, the other thing too, and, and you'll be interested to see, the, yeah, yeah, you notice how this piece is red and it doesn't match everything. Well, it's not because I didn't paint it, but I'd love to. Um, I actually have something called a pole master. And what you can do is put it here and it's another camera. And as you put it there and it lines up and you use a computer and you can see Polaris and the stars that surround it on the screen and you go through kind of a, a method to align it and you can really get precise polar alignment with that before you even start anything. And so I'll, I'll do that as well. And it's, it mounts onto that front part. The but telephones have compasses that actually work really good. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And I don't think the, there's any magnetic stuff. I've never found that they, they do bother it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think they're, they're aligning off of the satellites opposed to actually the pole. Yep. Anything else? Good. Okay, stay tuned. We've got a couple more to come. Yes, we, we've, next week, next month, we've got uh, Rick's got an alt as that he'll do it. That's the the one that does the square wave, but his is better than just a square wave. I think he can actually draw a line. So, thank you very much.